Right, so Dan Warren just put out a video called DJs Want Loud Masters Because DJs Are Idiots. Now, I'm a DJ, so let me respond to that. Got my boys with me for backup, so what could possibly go wrong? So for our regular viewers of the channel who come here to get Cubase tutorials, I realize that doing a reaction video is a little bit off brand. So I think we should begin by talking about who Dan Worrell is and what little I know about his background and talk a little bit about myself and what little I know about my background. So about 99% of people who have ever bought Falcon 2 by UVI will have taken one look at that user manual and just thought, f*** that. Let's get on YouTube. Hi, and welcome to this introduction to UVI Falcon version 2. The and you would have been greeted by that calm and soothing voice, which is Dan Worrell. Now, I realised that Falcon 2 was a bit of a niche synth, so you're more likely to recognise his voice from the Fab Filter videos. Hi, and welcome to this introduction to Pro Q3. And for those of you that have watched his tutorials, you know that the man is exceptional at explaining things in a concise, precise, and very easy to follow way, even though a lot of the topics he covers are really quite complex and quite complicated. Now that is a skill. Now, as well as producing tutorial videos for these plugin manufacturers, he also has his own YouTube channel. And from watching the videos on there, I can gather that he is a live sound engineer, a studio sound engineer, a talented producer, and a talented musician. So my name is Craig Lopez. I'm a full-time DJ here in Hong Kong. I'm also a producer. I make Cubase tutorials here on YouTube. And I think this is quite important for what's coming up next. I've also trained as a live sound engineer at one of the biggest audio production companies in the Southern Hemisphere. So this is a company that would do the live sound for Acts like Eminem, Bon Jovi, The Wiggles, you get the idea. Now this isn't going to be like a true first time reaction video because I have seen this before and no doubt while the camera's rolling I will forget all of the amazing points that I wanted to bring up but that's the way these things go sometimes. So let's get into the video. Hi and welcome back. A few people didn't like the animated waveform display for my voiceover, but I've still no intention of appearing on camera, so I thought I'd try this spectrogram instead. Well, that's one win for the DJ already. <laughs> Let me know if you like that better. Anyway, part two of my Fab Filter tutorial about loudness has just gone up, and predictably there are a few naysayers. Now, I haven't actually watched that second fab filter video on loudness i did watch the first one but i haven't seen part two yet so maybe i should watch that although i'm quite scared as to what the comment section is going to be like on that video if it's made him make this video calling dj idiots so maybe i will stay away from that video actually specifically lots of djs are telling me that edm masters need to have average levels up at minus six lufs otherwise they can't get loud enough or they're inconsistent with other masters that are up at those levels, or that they simply lack the punch in energy if mastered quieter. So first off, let's go to Beatport, which is where I buy 99% of the music that I DJ with. And let's just buy the record that is at number one on the charts. I don't know what it is. I've not heard it before, I don't think. Let's just buy it. Now, obviously, I won't be able to play because of copyright reasons, but I will be able to run it through a loudness analyzer. And let's run that through ADPTR's metric AB. And yeah, we can see everything is really, really loud. But yeah, let's get back to the video. So let's examine those claims one by one. First of all, can't get loud enough. What? You're playing through a PA system, for God's sake. Just turn it up. You don't need fake artificial loudness when you've got thousands of watts of amplification driving dozens of speakers. I mean, you're probably way too loud already, anyway. So I'm a club DJ, as in a DJ in nightclubs, and I guess the skill that most people will be familiar with what DJs 
have is the ability to mix seamlessly between tracks to a point where it can be difficult for the average listener to even know when we're switching between two different tracks. So the way it works is I'll have one track that's playing through the club sound system that everyone can hear and the track that I want to queue up and mix into the track that's playing over the sound system I will be monitoring in my headphones. Now all different DJs kind of have their own variations, little techniques on how they do this but me personally I like to have both the track that is playing on the sound system and the track that I'm queuing up both in my headphones at the same time. I like to have my headphones on as much as I can, and I like to have my headphones at as low a volume as I possibly can. Because when you work in a club, the sound system's always really loud. Usually the monitors are really loud. Now sometimes we do have control over the monitor volume, but sometimes we don't. So for that reason, I just like to have everything in my headphones as quiet as possible to try and save my hearing for as long as I possibly can. Now my DJ headphones do quite a good job of cancelling out extraneous noise, but obviously within the context of a club, it's never going to do that 100% because club sound systems are loud. So obviously I can hear the rumblings of the track that is playing over the club sound system through my ears at the same time as hearing the track in my headphones. And if I'm trying to cue up a track that is quite a lot quieter than the track that's already playing, it can be really, really... <coughs> I, now, I can do my best to balance it with the gain in my headphones, but once I take my headphones off and start to pull that fader in, it's never going to be exactly as I thought it would be in my headphones. Like, never. I can get close, but it's not going to be the same. So you might be thinking, I can quite easily just bring the volume in by a little bit and test it, bring it back out, change the gain, all that kind of thing. And club songs are usually like five or six minutes long, so I've got quite a long time to do that. And in a lot of cases, yes, that's correct. But you also have to take the environment in which I work in into account. So I work in a club which is obviously full of lots of very drunk and inebriated people. People will always want to come up and take a selfie in the booth. They might want to give you a shot of tequila, which of course I'm not complaining about, but of course I'm going to drink it because at the end of the day, my role is customer service. I've got to be nice to the customers. Sometimes a manager might come in to the DJ booth with a VIP that I've got to schmooze and talk with. So that few minutes I had to do the mix sometimes turns into 10, five seconds and if I'm bringing in a track quickly and I'm lowering the volume, the, like the overall volume in the club, I'm not just bringing down the audio volume, I'm bringing down the energy level. And when you're a DJ in a club, you have everybody looking at you all the time. And if you bring that energy down for just a few seconds, people notice and people blame you for it. As a live engineer, if my console wasn't in an ideal location, I would walk out into the crowd mid-song to judge my mix. Otherwise, I could be sucking badly out there, and I'd never know. If your DJ booth is not ideally placed to judge how loud the PA stacks are, walk out to check, or you're not doing your job properly. Right. <laughs> walk out to check your levels. So, if you're the only DJ playing that entire night, then before the crowd gets there, of course, you're going to walk out, check the levels. Of course you are. But... You've got to think about pacing. So a DJ is in control of the pace and the atmosphere of the night. So at the beginning of the night, when there's only a few tables in, people are just having a few quiet drinks or getting ready to get amped up for late in the night, I'm going to have the overall gain, the master gain, lower than I will have it when the club is packed. Because obviously, when the club is packed, there's going to be a lot more noise and you're going to have to be louder than the noise of all those drunk people but also the louder things are the more people are going to want to dance now the other thing is most of the time when you're DJing in a club you're going to be either following somebody or going on before somebody or sometimes both now if the DJ before you has everything super loud and then you come in and kind of bring down the volume of everything especially in a packed club people are going to notice that duck in volume. And if you're on first and you want to control the overall levels, of course you can do that. But if the, when the next DJ comes on and he just raises the gain, then obviously people will feel that the mood has also raised. And 
yeah, you'll be kind of judged on that by the general public. And you have to remember that 99% of people in a club aren't audiophiles. They just want loud music that they can dance to at the end of the day. And if you're too big a name DJ to mingle with the crowds, you can delegate the job to someone else, right? Otherwise, you're damaging your audience's hearing. And if they're too wasted to realise, that doesn't absolve you of any responsibility. Okay, so damaging the general public's hearing, that's obviously not a good look and not something anybody would ever or should ever want to do or do on purpose anyway. But when it comes to clubs, obviously we have the CDJs that are rooted into the mixer and then from the mixer we're going into the club sound system. Now the club sound system is what controls the overall level and 99% of the time us as DJs have no access to the actual amps of the club. We have no access to the limiter in the club. Now a lot of the time the actual racks that drive everything are nowhere even near the DJ booth. So the responsibility of the overall loudness really falls on the club owners or the people that tuned the sound system, not really the DJ. And you're making the live engineers forced to listen to you while packing up the gig that's just ended despise you deeply and profoundly. (laughs) So I mentioned before that I trained as a live sound engineer. Now I remember one time in Australia, the gig was, I believe, cream fields or something like that, like a big, massive dance festival and I remember the front of house guy he was the English guy really really sweet nice guy and there was a really big name DJ on whose name I won't mention after his set he came down and started screaming at the engineer because the engineer had turned down the volume between the last engineer that was playing and him starting his shift and that DJ did not like that and he came down and he started screaming at the engineer do you know what it's like to be a DJ And just calm as anything, the engineer just looked at him and was like, yes, I have pressed play before. It was quite funny, but perhaps he needed to have been there. But as my time training as a live sound engineer, obviously I met loads and loads of actual sound engineers. And the one topic that bonds all sound engineers is their hatred for DJs. It's like, you know, when you're in a pub and you're with somebody you don't really know and there's a lull in conversation, you might bring up sports. Like, if you're American, you might bring up the baseball or the basketball. Or if you're British, you might bring up the football just to stop that lull in conversation. Well, this despise for DJs is kind of the thing that bonds all live sound engineers together. Like, when there's that lull in conversation, they'll be like, oh, the DJ's a dick. They spend a lot of time talking about how much they don't like DJs. Now, on the other hand, apart from that DJ who was shouting at my friend, I don't think I've ever heard a DJ even mention sound engineers in conversation. Like, it's not even a bunch of people that DJs even consider as a thing. (laughs) Sorry about that. While we're on the subject, if you don't know how to use a DJ mixer properly, when I'm talking about setting a basic gain structure here, not advanced effects features, What are you doing even calling yourself a DJ? That's like a guitarist that hasn't bothered to learn how to tune their instrument. (laughs) This is true. This is true. DJs should learn how to use their equipment. But (laughs) this is the industry that we work in. So I've been doing this like a long time and I have followed DJs who are just there because of the way they look. It happens model DJs, you get models who want to become DJs. A lot of the time they're not even mixing. They have pre-prepared something at home or even worse still, they've had somebody else pre-prepare their set and then they just get up and just play with dials and yeah, that's the worst. It's worse. It's the worst thing following someone like that. Like, they don't even have the dials at 12 o'clock. They have like every dial all the way off. Yeah. DJs, learn to use your equipment, 100%. Okay, let's talk about consistency. DJs need all their tracks to be at the same level because they don't know how to use the DJ mixer. So I won't repeat what I said about actual mixing, but let's talk about this from a producer's point of view. So 
a DJ producer. So first of all, not all DJs are producers. I would say about 90% of all the DJs that I know do not produce. They just buy songs, play them, and they're very good at what they do. Now, as a producer, when I sat making a track for hours, days, weeks on end, fine-tuning everything, getting all the dynamics perfect, that track becomes my baby. And a lot of the time I do want a big dynamic range, so there's a lot of change in emotion between like the quieter part and the louder part and everything kicks in. You spend a lot of time tweaking that. And then you go into a club and you play that track against all these like crazy, crazy masters that have all been limited to within an inch of their life. Now, of course, I want my track to stand up against these tracks, so I'm going to raise up the gain dial on my track. But the problem is, is if my overall loudness as opposed to just the peak levels of my track are quieter, if I keep raising that gain dial, my track is eventually going to start going into the limiter of the club. Now, I don't know what kind of quality that limiter is. I don't know how harsh the settings are on there, but all I'm trying to do is match the loudness of my track with this crazy master track already. And yeah, if I'm just straight away running into that limiter, my track is going to sound like absolute garbage compared to the track that has been mastered to sound like that, to sound that loud. So unfortunately, my only option is to go back and then master my track in a similar way so I don't run into those kind of problems when I'm playing live. Okay, let's talk about consistency. DJs need all their tracks to be at the same level because they don't know how to use the DJ mixer. I mean, every channel has a gain trim and a fader, and there's a master volume as well. Which part do you not understand? This is... Sounds very condescending there, doesn't it? It's like a guitarist requesting that all songs just stay in C major so he doesn't have to move his fingers. That happens. That definitely happens. As a live engineer, I would routinely mix bands with 32 channels coming from the stage, sometimes even more. If I was in monitor world, I might have to create up to a dozen separate monitor mixes and keep every musician on stage happy at the same time. Yeah, like I say, I've worked with tons of live sound engineers. Those people are geniuses. I've learned so much from them. Even though I don't work in live sound anymore, a lot of the things that I learn from them, I do pass on to you guys in my tutorials. You want sympathy because you can't manage one stereo channel? But again, <laughs> you can hear this kind of hatred for DJs from his work in live sound engineering coming through there. <laughs> okay, last one. Quieter mixes don't have the punch and energy of louder mixes. But that's just not true. In fact, the truth is exactly the opposite. With less limiting, your EDM tracks will have punchier kicks. Right, so I think I've already kind of covered my view on what he's talking about here. More infectious grooves, more rousing build-ups. Like, I fully agree, 100% fully agree with everything he's saying there. But let's have a look at some statistics here. Right, how many tracks are on Beatport? Nine million. And now, as a producer, if I want to sell my tracks on Beatport and I'm giving them this big dynamic range, the problem is most of the DJs, and it is mainly DJs who are buying music off Beatport, most of them are not producers. When they're flicking through the hundreds of tracks that they need to flick through to buy the 50 tracks that they're going to buy for that week, before they buy the 50 tracks next week and their 50 tracks the week after that. If they just hear my track on Beatport and it's just super quiet compared to all the other tracks, psychologically, my track is just gonna sound weaker and they're not gonna buy it. That's just, that's just the truth. There's, as much as I don't want it to be that way, that's just the way it is. That's nine million tracks I've gotta compete with. And as a bonus, they won't be so likely to kill the PA system. Yes, that's right. You thought limiting your peaks was protecting the PA system from overs? I'm afraid you were doing the opposite. In fact, power amplifiers are quite good at recreating short, loud peaks without clipping. They will usually be happy to exceed their rated output for brief transients. And PA speaker drivers will usually handle those gracefully as well. Yeah, of course, everything he's saying is correct there. There's no doubt that Dan Warhol is a genius, but... I say, I just, he's never worked as a DJ before. He probably doesn't want to ever work as a DJ, but it's not as simple and as cut and dry as he's making it out. 
As a live engineer, I could push the PA right to its limits with a live band and rarely have any issues. Then the idiot DJ would start playing and those flat-topped, stupidly limited and clipped waveforms would rip through speaker drivers like butter. This is not our fault. <laughs> That's just... We don't, we don't individually create the industry. It's been like that for a long time. The only thing we can do is try and compete. Regardless <clears throat> of how conservatively I set the limiters on the PA system controllers. Seriously, DJs, if you didn't play such badly mastered material and consistently burn out drivers, the venues could actually afford to pay you more. We get paid all right, trust me. <laughs> This has turned into more of an anti-DJ rant than I intended. But honestly, I think it's totally justified. Partly justified, partly justified. Now, I was a bit disappointed when I clicked on this because I thought he was going to take more of a jokey approach. Obviously, he wanted to put a few people in their places about a few things, but I thought it would be a bit more tongue-in-cheek. But obviously, his years as a live sound engineer has just built up this utter hatred for DJs that I don't think he's going to grow out of any time soon. I mean, electronic dance music. There's a clue in the name. It's music for dancing to. The rhythm... Exactly, it's music for dancing to, so... Yes, from a sound engineer's point of view, all we're doing is mixing two tracks together. But just like with any job, there are so many layers that you only really understand when you actually do that job. Like for me, I would say about 25% of my job is the technical side, like learning how the equipment works, learning how to beat match, learning how to harmonically mix different tracks together. Like the other 75% is reacting to whatever is in front of you. So DJing is all about creating a vibe and riding that vibe out throughout the night. So sometimes you wanna raise the energy. Sometimes you might look at people, they look like they're getting a bit tired, a bit worn out. You wanna bring the energy down just a little bit. Sometimes you might see that the dance floor has been packed for an hour straight and there's nobody buying any drinks at the bar. Nobody's buying any drinks at the bar. The club's not making any money. The club's not going to employ you again. So again, you need to bring down the level, make sure people have a bit of a rest, go to that bar, buy some drinks. And like I said before, I have thousands and thousands of tracks. I need to know what track is going to create what kind of mood. There are certain tracks that you can play at one point of the night that you just couldn't possibly play at another point of the night. You need to know where all these are. You need to know how to blend them all. There's a lot more going on than just mixing two tracks together. Like the mixing of the two tracks together, like I say, is kind of the very base level of what we do. ...are the most important element. Yet you're telling me this is the one genre where it's absolutely critical that you remove any trace of a transient from the final master. Dumbest thing I ever heard. Now, obviously, he's responding to the comment section on one of his YouTube videos, which you should probably never do, but in a YouTube comment, there's no nuance into what anybody's saying. You can't really explain yourself in a few sentences. So anyway, I thought I would just use my small platform as a, as a right to reply. Maybe you'll watch this, maybe you won't. I think he will. I do have his permission to use this video in my video and he does seem like a nice guy. But yeah, anyway, I hope that was taken within the respect in which I meant it to, even though I'm not really sure how respectful I should be to someone who's calling myself and all of my work colleagues idiots. Maybe I should get some little dig in. Maybe I'll just spell his name with one L. I know he doesn't like that. But yeah, anyway, that's it for now. I probably won't be doing any more videos like this unless somebody says something that I really think I need to respond to, but that's quite unlikely. But anyway, yeah, that's it for now. I've been Craig Lopez. This has been Tutorialism. Now go watch Dan Worrell's videos. Peace.